but I think somebody with malevolent intentions is not, ne I mean, they don't necessarily need to carry something, as has already been mentioned by Dr Lewis, it could, could actually be a swarm of them causing... I, I believe anything with malicious intentions probably isn't going to carry any transforming technology at all. Okay. Um, a number of, we've already heard mentioned a couple of times this idea of the unmanned traffic management system and a number of the um, responses we had uh, talked about the the need for such a system. Just for the benefit of those that might be watching, the National Air Traffic Services have described such a system as a known environment where we can see all traffic, manned and unmanned, identify individual aircraft and know where each is heading, accommodate all traffic safely and efficiently. What are the potential drawbacks and benefits of such a system? Happy to, happy to jump in. Um, I'll speak first to the benefits. Um, I think you wouldn't have to spend particularly very long Googling um, for the potential use cases to various different industries, public services, for the advantageous use of drones. Um, it's quite common also you see drones being deployed for safety of life type scenarios. Um, the challenge is today it's not possible to use drones in all the ways that people wish to um, because there is no unifying traffic management system. Um, Broadly speaking, the regulations require all of us, however we operate a drone, to keep that drone in our line of sight. A UTM is a potential foundation requirement for helping to remove that for legitimate authorised use of drones. So if we wish to see those benefits, we require some understanding, um, some technology which can bridge the gap between the heavily regulated, heavily human dependent um, field of air traffic control today, and we trust air traffic controllers with our safety every time we fly. It seems logical, given that we have one sky and we need to share it with unmanned traffic, that we need systems that can also bridge the gap so that the folks who are looking after the manned aircraft can also see the unmanned aircraft. And it, so do you see that applying particularly around airports and other sensitive kind of establishments? Uh, absolutely. Or do you see it being pretty much all airspace? I think, um, in my experience, um, People are, can, can jump to the 50 or 100 year scenario and we can imagine millions of autonomous vehicles. Whatever that picture of the future is you hold, you could be absolutely correct. However, it's important to remember that in order to make the first, the first steps in this scenario, we already have great regulations um, for effectively carving up higher risks within the airspace today. So to your point around airports, I think airports make logical choices um, given that they cover quite quite large urban areas in many respects. The restriction zones extend for many nautical miles around the airfields. It makes sense that if you are looking to deploy a UTM, you would look first to do it in those areas that are controlled. Um, there is no requirement, um, from a technical perspective at least, to wait until we have some as yet uninvented technology to suddenly see all aircraft in the sky, including those which are perhaps even less than 250 grams. Can I add first, coming back on the uh, question of the 250 gram threshold? Uh, historically, that uh, threshold was established in the USA when they set up the registra registration scheme based on uh, security studies. That is, it's a threshold that was assessed as the harmless threshold, so you cannot hurt anybody with that uh, kind of uh, drone. Uh, the EU regulation also uh, has a paragraph on that uh, threshold and it states that it's based on security studies about harmlessness. So then when it comes to the idea of a swarm of drones, I have to say that currently on the commercial market there is no such thing and the focus is really about data capture. So that's where really the focus is and I'm not aware of significant uh, swarming technologies in the commercial market other than for shows, just like the, I think it was Intel that produced a, uh, a show at the uh, Olympics uh, opening. But beyond that, I'm not aware of uh, existing solutions available on the market. So clearly it is not a technology that would be available for a random person in its garage. I think it's more military grade technology, at least for now. 
So when it comes to UTM, the benefits, um, we certainly agree uh, that a UTM uh, uh, wears a lot of uh, benefits and merits, especially when it comes to uh, facilitating uh, operations around uh, dense areas of traffic, such as uh, airports. Uh, the downside of UTM, I'm not sure really. Uh, maybe it would be about the cost and who's bearing the cost of the UTM. Mm. Yeah, I think so. just, um, really conscious of time, but just really briefly add, add to that. I think um, colleagues have talked about sort of the benefits. I think some of the questions uh, for us is around the um, sort of the, the operating model, the services model, and the sort of financing. At the moment, the UK's air traffic control system is largely funded by kind of commercial aircraft um, operators who pay fees and, and the military pay elements. I think if we're to see uh, new classes of um, uh, space user making uh, use of services or infrastructure. And the question is who is who is going to pay for that and what is the mechanism that, that sort of sits as, as, as part of that. Um, I think we're sort of beginning through the uh, Department of Transport's aviation strategy and what we're doing beginning to think about I was what that about might to come on like. and ask how the government might support. So, I mean, you, uh, Richard, have talked about a champion in this area and <coughs> you're talking about government funding in this area yes. so I think that message has been received, thank you. Um, and finally can, can I ask about the technological advancements that will be required to enable the creation of such a system? Richard, maybe it's best um, directed to yourself. I think um, I would like to set, set the field initially and just say I think we have all of the technology that we need today to be able to welcome drones in controlled airspace in, in many locations. However, to caveat that with not beyond visual line of sight, and that's one of the reasons not, sorry. not beyond visual line of sight today. Right. Um, to do that, we must establish first a registration and identity system. We must have some mechanism of electronic conspicuity, and that has to go beyond just drones. That has to include all aircraft, all users of the airspace. Otherwise, the function of a UTM is severely Im impaired because it cannot see, quote unquote, everything in the airspace. So we have, uh, to, to Mr. Johnson's point, we have um, questions around who is going to be responsible for those systems, how is that information going to flow into them, what is the regulation for those types of systems. To my knowledge, um, no such regulation exists today. But we are already seeing great, um, great steps being taken around the world. Um, the UK is... Um, Pretty high up there in terms of pushing the boat and really, um, really wanting to try new things. We uh, today are seeing national air traffic services deploy technology to six airports, including London's Heathrow, which enables legitimate drone operators to request permission and receive that permission digitally um, to fly. It's a great first step. Well, we must roll this out ubiquitously um, so that other people can share in the exchange of that information. So I think again, just just coming back to. The technology is here to manage that flow of information. There is limited technology available today for a drone to make much of its own decisions. But again, this is where a role of a UTM can help um, by passing flight plans, approving routes ahead of time, etc. Yes, can I just really quickly add to that? I think one of the, um, as well as our focus on aviation safety, as the CA, I think we recognise we have a role in at facilitating innovation, so understanding what innovations are coming, understanding what the sort of safety and economic implications are, um, helping uh, and then helping kind of companies understand what the, the kind of regulation uh, uh, you know, framework is, where the flexibilities are, uh, and particularly work with them about what a safety case um, or help, help them with a sort of safety case and w work through that. We have just um, launched a sort of an innovation hub and we've selected six companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, to work with over an uh, initial period, including Altitude Angel, where we are really um, trying to identify these particular um, sort of technologies or innovations and wanting to um, help create safe spaces to trial some of these things, partly so that the industry uh, can benefit and understand what, what, uh, what the opportunities and what the risks are and how they might be managed. But secondly, also as important is for us as a regulator to, to learn and understand uh, from these technologies so we can better anticipate how the regulatory frameworks and the policy frameworks might need to evolve going forward. Maybe if I can add uh, a similar um, a similar experimentation or actually operation uh, is happening in the USA. 
uh, in a way, is called LAANC, I think, like a low altitude authorization notification capability. It's fundamentally about automating the application and then the approval process for uh, drones to enter into restricted uh, uh, areas around aerodromes. It's in partnership between the equivalent of the CAA and the industry. And uh, as far as I know, it's going out uh, smoothly. It's applying for now only for uh, the equivalent of the commercial operators. And it's been rolled out in hundreds of aerodromes in the US, I understand. In the US? In the USA, yes. It's worth adding. Um, NASA are evaluating today the trial, uh, trial of similar technology here in the UK. The technology I refer to is called Airspace User Portal, and it's publicly accessible today in those six evaluation airports. I believe there is a plan to roll that out, but it's broadly very similar to the LAANC system in the US. Um, and it, uh, so Heathrow Airport, um, there are a few others. I would have to get back to you and submit the, the full list. With, uh, with more, more information? Yes, I can, absolutely. I will follow up directly after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. Very quick question from Martin and a quick answer, please, before we go to Bill. Just on the future technology sake. So I'm just looking for some reassurance. I'm sure you probably think that AI has something to do with any kind of unmanned vehicle and its ability to not have what some people would say is non-human engagement, but AI is only what it is on the tent. It says in the tent, artificial. It's not real. So I'm just looking for some clarity. You accept that if there's to be any type of AI equipment in the sky that it really should have and requires human engagement and ownership of that process. If I may, um, I'll start. I'll start the conversation in, on that regard. Um, more, more of a quick answer than a question. Understood. <laughs> first, first, just your acceptance that it's only artificial; it's not real, and it requires a, a human being to be in overall control of it. The role of um, artificial intelligence in a UTM system is probably <coughs> extremely limited, if it's there at all. When it comes to equipment on board the drone, um, I'll leave that to the drone manufacturers to decide what they feel is appropriate to put on their machines. Uh, oh, so was there someone I need to come in? No, I was just uh, complimenting that uh, uh, when it comes to the use of artificial intelligence uh, for the uh, safety and airworthiness aspect of the drone, uh, there is no, we cannot prove uh, uh, what's happening behind uh, AI. Therefore, when it comes to developing modules such as uh, autopilot or the brain, if you want, of the drone, I think it's highly li unlikely that uh, AI is used today because you cannot prove it's safe, you don't know how it works. Thank, Thank you. you. Bill? Thanks, Ian. If, if I could follow in for Carol and, and the unmanned traffic management systems and what the term is beyond visual line of sight aspects of drones. Um, you, you'll be aware that I think it was NATS created and other stakeholders were involved in Operation Zenith based at uh, Manchester Airport. So, what lessons can be learned from that particular operation, namely Operation Zenith, uh, for the creation of a national or indeed international unmanned traffic management system, which I suspect would have to be integrated to existing airspace management? Go ahead. Richard, you, want to, you were very direct and sure. in the trial. So. Um, again, trying to keep the answers brief. Um, if the committee wish to, to have a look at the information that was learned, there is a website that you can go to, operationsnf.com, um, highlighting some of the key, key facets there. We learned that um, much of the technology required to submit, uh, to, sorry, to support incredibly complex drone operations, even in um, heightened security environments like a busy international airport, exists today. We also learned that there is no magic bullet, silver, uh, silver bullet solution for detecting rogue drones, but that there are some very good, very capable systems. Um, we also learned that, um, particularly when it comes to securing facilities like an airport, a perfect solution doesn't exist, but there are probably a number of sensors that must come together unified by a UTM system. Um, we also learned, actually, and this is a uh, very interesting aspect that in the removal of humans from the loop, there is an inordinate amount of humans required to do that safely. Um, Operation Zenith, I would just commend again the fact that there are about 170 different individuals from 25 organisations that came together to prove that even with today's regulations, you can um, do some incredible work with drones safely in and around an airfield that also involves manned aviation as well. I'm I would support that. I mean, I, I think the way forward is to identify these opportunities to trial and test and understand what some of the sort of interactions, what the safety case looks like, who needs to kind of um, 
uh, cooperate. Um, so I think Operation Zenith, from our perspective, was a really good piece of work. I, I, Rich has talked about the, the lessons learned. Um, and I think over time there will need to be more such um, trials to test the different elements of UTM. Um, but I think your point then to think about what the sort of rollout plan, both um, you know, sort of on, on a systemized basis, kind of locally, then sort of regionally, and then nationally, I think will be uh, inevitable. Still in the, beyond the visual line of sight operations, um, could you give us some reason why it's, you believe it's essential for traffic management system f for these operations? And can such a traffic management system be integrated to the existing? And I heard you, you, you touching on contact and controllers. Who would fund this additional pressure on the management of airspace? Um, so I, I think potentially um, UTM poses some quite fundamental uh, questions around the, the infrastructure required to support it and the role of um, sort of manned and unmanned uh, aviation and, and how they work uh, uh, together. I have no doubt that some of the um, sort of existing air traffic management systems uh, would need to be sort of um, up updated and capable of integrating a broader suite of sort of sensor information and sort of um, <coughs> technology. I think the key question then is who has ultimate control of, 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 of the system when you've got a mixture of manned uh, and unmanned aircraft. Those are really important questions. I, we haven't got answers to those today, but we absolutely know those are the fundamental issues. But I think we get to understanding what the, the issues are through the sort of trials that Operation Zenith and some of the things that we will be doing through our innovation sandbox will we'll test. If I may just add also, um, it's important to remember UTM is predominantly software, so therefore the costs of running the software do not vary considerably based on the number of facilities or the type of traffic that you wish to handle. A significant goal of UTM is to integrate into existing air traffic management networks, ATM. Um, if a UTM operates as a, as a silo, we will have uh, a huge challenge. And this was a significant takeaway from Operation Zenith where all of this was integrated into the tower at Manchester ATC at, at no cost other than the time cost uh, to, to Manchester Airport. So you're suggesting two things here. You're suggesting an integration with the system, and you hinted at a silo system for UTMs. Uh, actually, no. Uh, the UTM, right. quite the opposite, shouldn't be a silo. Right. Sorry. Right. That's right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, still in the beyond the the, the the visual line of sight operations, uh, and notwithstanding parcel deliveries, etc., what opportunities lie in, in that field of the movement of? drones, uh, not necessarily near to air, airfields or air, airports, but in, in, the, in the wider urban or rural areas. What opportunities? Where do you see this going beyond the visual light? We, we, so currently we've got about 5,000 uh, uh, entities who've got uh, permission from us to operate sort of commercially, and uh, they're sort of a big range. Um, some of them uh, include um, uh, blue light services, so um, sort of police, fire brigade being able to use drones. Um, we've seen surveying companies uh, looking at sort of uh, assessing sort of agricultural land, um, surveying power lines, surveying tops of buildings, insides of chimneys. Um, so both I think the volume of information that these operators are saying that they can get from drones um, compared to conventional surveying means. Um, but, but also, I think part of their argument is a, as a positive safety argument because they're saying rather than putting a person up a you know, power line or inside a chimney or on top of a building, we can send a drone um, and the, the, the volume and the quality of information will be larger and it means we, we don't need to put somebody in, in, from a health and safety perspective in quite that same uh, position of risk that we did before. Uh, colleagues may want to add in terms of use case. Oh, we're, we're seeing a really big range of um, operators come forward. Yeah, maybe I could compliment from the uh, commercial operator side. Uh, clearly, the ability to fly beyond visual line of sight would be a key to unlock the potential for economic growth, because when you think about it, VLOS is quite restrictive. It's a few hundred meters, uh, whereas there are many operations where it would be beneficial to go beyond that direct visual link uh, with your drone. 
you were mentioning emergency services or search and rescue, uh, when you go and uh, when you go out and try and find. Uh, you know, a missing person, clearly it would be uh, beneficial to be in a position to go beyond the few hundred meters. It is also true for commercial applications such as uh, infrastructure monitoring, going through in inspection of pipelines, or as is happening today for inspection of uh, offshore oil and gas uh, uh, facilities. So uh, clearly <coughs> enabling BV loss would be uh, a, a very key positive uh, impact to the uh, impact on what about sort of final mile deliveries is that envisaged and if so what's the time so, scale? yes there is a, a lot of headlines uh, with regards to amazon last mile package delivery as well as uh, flying taxis as it happens on a day-to-day -day basis this is not the real life of commercial operators today it is very much about eye in the sky VLOS and uh, data capture. It is true that there will be a pass uh, further uh, with regards to uh, transporting. So the drone would not only carry sensors to uh, bring data, but it could carry small payloads or very large payloads such as uh, people. But uh, uh, right now, I'm not aware, I mean, there are a few solutions that exist that are purely prototype, certainly nothing that is uh, available on a very wide uh, um, on Is a it very a question of time, is it when rather than if, or uh, is it still quite uncertain as to whether this will happen? I think it will happen, but uh, there are several hurdles. The first one would be societal acceptance. Uh, that drones are used uh, for that uh, purpose because some studies have shown that the public uh, perfectly understands the use of drones for you know, emergency services, for data capture, etc. But there may be some uh, concerns about using drones for last mile delivery or flying taxis. And then in terms of uh, technology, I'm not an expert, but uh, you know, I would say that uh, uh, there would be some need of further assurances if you change the scenarios where the drone can fly in terms of, uh, I'm going to pronounce the word, product airworthiness. So, so I think, yes, it will happen, uh, but uh, probably not in the absolute immediate future. Okay, Bill? Finally, from me, um, do you, do you all believe that you, you need a management system for that traffic, for the UTMs? Is it essential that it has a system that records and knows where these um, miniature aircraft or drones are to protect the registered flying public who are you know, flying in airlines? Or is there no risk between yeah. the two? If I may, um, I think we believe it's an essential part of infrastructure requirement for a country to establish a, a centralised repository of what's moving through the sky and where it's planning to go. But to, ca to caveat that with, we don't think it's, uh, it's necessary at all to have just one system um, that prohibits other folks from being able to develop services like Amazon and Uber from being able to access that system. So whilst there might be one central coordinating repository, it's worth mentioning that a UTM, as we have the opportunity to deploy it here in the UK, has the potential to create a flourishing ecosystem for many different companies and all sorts of commercial and public services use. Uh, and that management system, part of that would be to protect the, the existing and future flying public? Uh, it, absolutely, its goal has to be safety. Yeah. Thanks very much. Quick question for Vicky and then Martin. I just wondered if one, wondered if you wanted to comment on Rwanda using drones to deliver blood, for blood transfusions to remote inaccessible ways. I under, understand a third of the blood is now delivered by drone. I absolutely want to comment because I'm working on a medical drone delivery. So it is clearly one of the uh, uh, most shining example of positive use of drones, including for transport purposes. So it is an American company, uh, actually, uh, uh, Zipline, that is behind uh, the scene in Rwanda and also in uh, Ghana, I think. Um, and, you know, to a certain extent, I very much look forward to a UK-based solution emerging with a similar technological uh, expertise and positive impact. Thank you. Martin. Um, new regulation will help small and medium-sized providers of services into the economic framework that we're all talking about, you know, the 
this system will help us with. Because all I hear so far is a lot about Amazon and other large conglomerates who have cornered the market in either data capture or in actually selling as services in this age in which we now live. So I'm just wondering where this fits with small and medium-sized businesses across the whole of the UK and Northern Ireland who want to get in here. How effective is it to enable them to grow for young entrepreneurs, uh, for young business people who want to engage in this market when it's already crowded by people like Amazon who tell us basically how to do things these days? Can I, shall I yeah, sure. So. Um, in our role at facilitating, facilitating innovation, I think we've um, set up a framework which first allows anybody to come and get to sort of uh, approaches and say, look, we're thinking of doing this. Can you point us in the right, right direction? Can you give us some um, some sort of early advice? I think we've tried to make that as open and, and transparent as possible. Secondly, where we are doing trials, for example, the, the six companies that are in the sandbox at the moment, one of the absolutely fundamental principles is that we take the learnings from that not, not the commercial IPR that sits with the companies, but, but the regulatory and the system learnings from that, and we make that transparent. Are so any we of those small and medium-sized companies, or are they all large companies? Uh, no, it's a mixture of um, uh, companies. Amazon is one, Nats are in there, um, Altitude Angel, uh, we've got Nesta, the um, uh, sort of National Science and Technology mm. uh, organisation as well. So we've, we've got a range in there, but, but as I say, one of the principles is that we take the learnings from that and we make them public and transparent so everybody um, in, in the SME sector can sort of understand where, where, how the regulations work, what the boundaries are, uh, and, and how we and, and make sure those learnings are accessible. Well, to we'll add into that, Richard, finally. Just to add that a, a UTM is a critical component in levelling the playing field for everybody. It provides the same access to, to the sky, whether you're Amazon or you are. Yeah, but a Amazon's creating a fortune out, going to create a fortune out of this. So, what are companies like Amazon going to put into the system? There are there are many different use cases for drones, of which Amazon and its drone deliveries is, is but one. So they won't and be putting anything into that. My only well, my worry is here that Amazon is going to get a lot of work done for it, and yet it's paying nothing into the system. There is a long-standing precedent today that if you're going to use the airspace for commercial gain, you pay for access to the airspace. I don't see the need to, to vary that beyond that paradigm. Therefore, those who put most burden on the system itself are those who pay the most. Um, that welcomes everybody into the system.